There's a great deal of wealth in um, religious tradition that um, needs to be needs to be restored to its place in people's awareness and attention. Um, I think that there's a kind of condescension to the modern audience that uh, is reflected in many ways, but certainly um, in the idea that they would not have any interest in historical tradition or intellectual tradition of their faiths. Um, I think that this has been a, a real impoverishment and, and has made people feel that religion itself is, is a much less uh, profound and grounded thing than it in fact is. And reading in this tradition helps people to recover that sense of the depth and range of thinking in religious traditions. Yes, and having it um, to respond to in their own thinking and their own writing. Um, anything, of course, as ancient as, as Christian thought or, or as old, <laughs> depending on the tradition, um, of course takes on the character of the period in which it was written. and, and uh, Theology always needs to be written again, you know. But I think that uh, the best theology is written in an awareness of what has been said before um, to, to affirm or elaborate or reject. Theological writing has been very important for your own life as a writer. Yes, it has been. Theology has simply um, always been an interest of mine insofar as the word always can be meaningfully used. And um, it's a, it's a luxury of my life that I've been able to pursue it as well as do fiction and other things. What drew you to, to running this workshop? What, what is the challenge of it and, 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 and the occasion of it for you? It's a, very, it's a very interesting and for me quite a unique experience to have 12 people in the room who are all very highly competent in very specialized fields of learning and very serious about what they do, you know. Um, and nevertheless uh, of a mind to see if they can speak to a wider audience than they feel they've done to this point. What are the barriers for them uh, and, and barriers that you see in theological writing today to reach wider audiences and grip them with the riches of these traditions? One barrier is that they are not confident of having an audience. Um, they're not confident of being able to publish or to be read beyond the fairly narrow confines of people who's, who seek out, you know, theological books. Um, they are also people with strong academic backgrounds who are in the habit of writing to a specialist community uh, who basically know essential things that the general reader would not know, and therefore there's a sort of an artificial narrowness in their concentration, in their, in their emphasis in any particular area. Um, and then, of course, there's the problem of eliminating academic jargon. Mm. <laughs> um, but it, it comes from the fact of their having been educated and acculturated to one specific environment, which is academic. Talking to the scholars in this workshop, they've use phrases like uh, finding their own voice, but also writing soul to soul and <laughs> taking the context seriously. And this is, and this has profoundly um, inspired them. Um, these obviously are, are, are aspects of writing that you think are very important for, for, for the author to, 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 to embrace. I think it's exceptionally important for theological writing. I think None of this is bad advice for virtually any kind of writing, but um, there, there is a, a kind of an artificiality that overtakes a written voice very readily. And um, I think that this distances theology or makes it feel an inauthentic. Um, I'm not saying that people should be personal or that they should be uncritical of what they're saying, but they should remember the centrality, the weight, the humanness of what they're saying, you know, and the fact that what they're doing in, is, is restoring a common possession rather than, you know, speaking from a lectern. Your, your novels, Gilead and, and Home, have spoken to so many people. But they're about pastors in, in families and in ordinary congregations and communities. These are very important 
people and, and, and communities to you? I mean, they, they, they demand all your art and insight as a writer. But the congregation today, the life of the pastor, are again rather like theological writings from the past, rather seen as marginal figures, marginal communities. But for you, are extraordinary places and people. Yes, and I think that if people consult their own experience, they very often find that these things are very central for them also. I mean, uh, as people in the world go, Americans are very churched or synagogued or whatever they, the expression should be. And uh, they think that perhaps they are a little bit alone in having a sustaining religious community. And um, I think that in general, they can extrapolate from their experience and imagine many very meaningful communities. You're a very active member of your own congregation. And I mean, theological thinking is important too for the life of the congregation. It certainly is. There's no question about it. It's the difference between religion and sort of self-help or something, you know. Theology is, of all modes of thought, it integrates all the elements of human experience more exhaustively than any of them, you know. Um, its purpose is to integrate at every level. And uh, that in itself, um, it, it, it means that meaning becomes pervasive rather than being isolated in narrow, narrow interests or narrow purposes and so on. Um, and, and it's very beautiful for that reason. And I think it uh, uh, properly does animate the church, which ought to in turn animate theology. Your concern too for the public voice of theology, your latest book, Absence of Mind, is not explicitly theological, but it is challenging reductive notions in our wider culture that the riches of the humanities, including religious traditions, are no longer insightful to the human condition. You very much want to challenge that. I certainly do. It's, it's a very odd, arbitrary thing, you know, that that the uh, these sort of uh, dismissive uh, notions of human mind and human inwardness and so on, they're, they're, they seem sort of arbitrarily associated with science. Uh, science itself says that the, the, the human mind is a profoundly mysterious thing, you know. Um, it's, I don't really see why there would be a difference between, for example, religious people and atheists on the subject of the value of, of the human mind and, and, and all that it's accomplished and so on. I, I don't see any logical necessity in this trivialization in any of the, any way of thought that we should take seriously. It seems like an opportunistic infection or something of the kinds of thinking that it's associated with, but it's very pervasive. You think that theologians have to recover not only their voice but their nerve in the wider public culture to, to have the confidence to, to speak in a theological voice and yet sensitive to, to other perspectives? Is that a yes, and I think frankly that they have to prepare themselves to do that. Um, but a, a broadening of perspective is something that I think that most theologians need um, and it would be the sort of thing that would perhaps entitle them to an authority that would be appropriate for them. That was very much the, the founding vision of the founder of this Center of Theological Inquiry, James McCord, whose looming portrait has sat over you all <laughs> over the last three weeks in, in, your, in your lunches together. But his vision was of theology being part of the larger conversation and being challenged by uh, insights from other disciplines. and, and mm -hmm. We want to thank you for, as one of our senior scholars, for challenging our writing fellows to follow uh, uh, that path, and uh, you've done an extraordinary job in helping them to do that. Well, thank you. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Thank it's you been very an much. Honor. <laughs> thank you. Thank you.